decision to work with Pebble. And has annual conference inviting uh, lovely colleagues, uh, Roy and Fine scholars, and try to invent our mutual understanding. Uh, this year, uh, we invite five uh, law and five, uh, seven finance high class papers from all over the world. And so we can learn a lot uh, from uh, each other. Also, we have uh, two panels uh, which has a focus on the shoulder voice in Asian country. I hope you can find interesting issues from uh, this panel as well. Uh, yes, uh, uh, all we know uh, that this kind of conference does not go on trip. So um, uh, uh, we would like to give a special thanks to Mrs. Elaine. <laughs> Elaine.
And the, the price of the input, that's just the way of the quarter supply and the producer to share the surplus from, from production. How we introduce uncertainty here is that with probability one, there's going to be a legal dispute over an amount D between the producer and the supplier. So they argue over an amount D, they go to the court, and there's uncertainty about this outcome. So there's some parameter lambda which determines the share that is allocated to the producer of the distributed amount D, and this is unknown. So the agents in the model, they can form beliefs about this, and they, and they can learn about it, but they don't know what the sort of distribution, what the average of this, of this lambda is going to be. We give both of them mean, var mean variance preferences so that they care about them. So now I will start just to sort of select some equations just to highlight some of the economics here. I will not go through all the equations that we have now. So because of the mean variances, so there's a disutility from uncertainty from variance. And the variance can be decomposed into two parts. So it's a standard variance decomposition. And the intuition for those two parts is as follows. So what we label parameter, parameter uncertainty here, you can think about this as there's uncertainty about the mean. So I don't know what on average the share of the legal dispute is going to be that's going to the producer or going to the supplier. So we think about this as systematic because that affects the average outcome across all cases. Okay? Because I don't know what the average outcome is going to be. And then it's the first part, the realization uncertainty, that sort of condition on knowing the distribution of this lambda. For an individual case, there's still uncertainty which of the you know, which um, possible realization of lambda is going to be realized for an individual case. So even if I perfectly know the distribution of lambda, what all the possible outcomes are, and the probabilities associated with it, for an individual case, I, I'm not, I don't know which value is going to be. Okay? But that is more easy in practice, right? Because if we have a lot of cases, we don't really care about the variation for individual cases, because if we have enough cases, we will always converge it again to, to, the, to the average. So that's sort of the first insight, that there are really some videos and practices of, of uncertainty that potentially could be diversified, and then there are systematic sources that even with a large number of cases. So I keep talking about idiosyncratic and systematic. So just to give you some examples of what we think are the idiosyncratic sources of mean uncertainty and what are systematic sources of mean uncertainty. So for example, there's, there's this literature on judge fixed effects, right? That judges have different preferences, biases, and how they decide cases. Well, if you go to the court, there are several judges, and your case is randomly assigned to one of those judges. Well, if those judges are very different, there's a lot of uncertainty. And depending on who, which judge your case is allocated to, the outcomes could be very different. However, if you have a large number of cases, you don't care that, you know, sometimes you get a more friendly judge, sometimes you get a more unfriendly judge. For a large number of cases, you really just care about the mean, right? Because this sort of individual case uncertainty that, that washes on with a large number of cases. It could be that even the same judge sometimes has a good day, sometimes has a bad day, right? So there can be all this sort of video characteristic shock. Your lawyer might have a bad day, perform, perform badly on an individual case, but again, this is something that with a large number of cases, what is wrong? But then there are systematic sources of the answer. For example, changes in law. Uh, if the law changes, well, this will affect all of your cases, and there's nothing really you can do. Even with a large number of cases, it may now affect the mean outcome of your, of, of, of your legal disputes, and therefore there's nothing you can do to preserve it. So now I will just not go through the equations anymore, I will just give you the, the intuition. So as I already mentioned, so if you are large, if you have a large number of cases, you still care about systematic big uncertainty, but no longer about big uncertainty. Okay, so there are some part of big uncertainty that can be diversified. There's another way how we can reduce the uncertainty, that's by learning about the, the integration. So in the model, this is kind of learning about lambda. So we learn about the distribution of lambda. So over time, as we are in a legal regime, we observe how you know, judges, regulators interpret the law. We learn more about what legal disputes look like, what the outcomes are, and that reduces the answer. The flip side of this is, well, if we have a shift in the legal regime, for legal regime, for example, the law changes, suddenly we lose all this information. Right now, we have to learn again how our, how our judge is going to interpret this law, you know, how, how is this applied in practice. So if there's a change in legal regime, that there's a decrease in deep uncertainty. Because we lose all the information that we that we got, that we acquired about the previous. That's sort of the theory part and then the simple insights of the theory. And we try to as much as possible now find some empirical support for for those um, predictions of the model. So I will be brief on the institutional setting um, today because we don't have that much time. So in so we will, use, we will look at bankruptcy law and then the allocation of, of, of credits between banks and firms. 
So in Korea, at the, so I should say this is for, the, for our sample period, there have been some institutional changes recently, but in, during our sample period, there were 14 courts that handled bankruptcy cases in Korea. And the really important thing for us is that there's a very clear allocation of firms to specific courts depending on geography. So we have the universe of firms in Korea, so most of the firms, they really just operate in, in one area. And depending on where their headquarters or you know, principal place of business is, they have to go to a specific court. So why is this important? We, we are going to generate um, variation in uncertainty across different courts and across time, so it's important that firms are allocated to a specific court because then the lead uncertainty of this specific course is directly the lead uncertainty that the firm is in. So there's a map, I you know, do not have time to go, to go through all the details here. So the, the second important thing is, in Korea, bankruptcy judges are not specialized, like for example in the US. So judges in Korea, they are considered to be generalists, so they will report, um, they rotate across different courts and court divisions. So typically when they come to the bankruptcy court, they have no prior experience with bankruptcy. Then during our sample period for most bankruptcy judges, the term was two years. And after these two years, then the team of bankruptcy judges is replaced by new bankruptcy judges. And condition on a case being filed in a court, there's a random assignment of cases to one of the judges. So now, how do we generate our measures of, of legal uncertainty? So for our sample period, for 10 years, we have data on every bankruptcy case in Korea and really every decision that judges make during, during those bankruptcy cases. And for those decisions that we can clearly um, identify or classify as debtor friendly or, or creditor friendly, we generate a measure for every judge where the most, you know, the judge, the, the value of one would be a judge that always makes debtor friendly decisions. A value of zero would be a judge that always makes creditor friendly decisions. So you can see here a distribution, so there's quite some variation that some judges are much more data friendly, some judges are much more credit friendly. The mean is about 0.6 for three for the average judge. Now, to get this time series variation, so the way that we that we kind of estimate those judge types is that for every when a new judge comes into a court, we set the prior belief about the judge's data friendliness at the mean, so it's the 0.643. And then we have a Bayesian learning model. So every month we observe on average just three to four decisions of the judge, and then the agents in, in the economy, they update their beliefs about the judge's type based on the, on, on the decisions that they observe. So I will show you this with an, with an example here, how this works for a given court. So for most courts, judges have a, have a term of 24 months in the bankruptcy court. So what you can see here, this is basically this black line is one judge, how our perception about the judge's data friendliness changes over time. So at time zero, the judge starts, that's the, the, the mean, that's our prior, so it's 0.643. For, <coughs> for this particular judge, it turns out when we observe the judge's decision, that actually this judge is much more credit friendly. So we learn over time that this judge actually makes much more credit friendly decisions than the average judge. There's a second judge in the court who is sort of closer to the average, so over time we see that it's the better um, friendliness of the judge is about 0.6. There's a third judge in the court, and here we can see that this judge actually is more data friendly. Okay, so that's sort of our, and we update this every month, so you can see on the x-axis, based on the observations that we, that we have about the judge's decision. Now we translate this into different measures of legal uncertainty. The first one here will be pre bond This is not really about legal uncertainty. This is just to take out the mean effects. So what you see on the, the left plot here, this is just the average. So what you see here, this is just the average of those three judges in, in, the, in the court over time. The second plot on the right side, this is what we label assignment uncertainty. That is the standard deviation of the judge type. So the more different those judges are, the higher the value. So the idea is that, well, if the judges would be all the same, we don't really care about which judge the case is allocated to because you know, there's no uncertainty. However, if the judges are very different, there's a lot of uncertainty now if we file at the court depending on which judge we, we are going to be alloc allocated to, the outcome might be fair. The other two measures, this is related to this idea of this learning that I briefly talked about earlier. So we look at the average number of decisions per judge that we observe in the court. So that's monotonically increasing. Over time, we see more decisions. So over time, this type of uncertainty goes down because we learn more and more about the judges, and we are more and more certain about the judges. On the flip side, what we have on the, on the right-hand side here, so that's just the linear increases, well, this is how far are we in, in the judge's term. 
The idea here is this is related to this regime change that I talked about earlier. The closer that you get to the end of the judge's term, the higher legal uncertainty, conditional on you know, that we that we learn something, uh, taking out sort of the learning effect with the with the first measure. The idea is the following. Well, think about your viewer from a bank's perspective. You think about lending to a firm. Probably the firm is not going to be called tomorrow, but maybe six months, 12 months, 18 months. The closer we are now towards the end of the bank judge's term, the more likely it becomes that the case is actually going to go to the new judges that will be, that will be appointed next, and we don't have any information on this. Right. So the closer we get to the end of this term, the higher the uncertainty, because it becomes more and more likely that our case will be, out of, will be handled by judges that we don't know anything. So I will have to choose some some tables to, to show you here. So I will this is kind of the main table in the in the paper. So what we have on the left hand side here, sorry, this should be uh, this should be a B. So it's the uh, the log of loan volume from bank E to firm I in a given month. And then we request this well on the mean tetra friendliness of the judge of the judges in a court and those three different uncertainty measures that I that I showed you. So I will skip over the first line because the, the mean effect is not really the main focus on the paper, and I will talk about lines two to two to four here. So the sigma that's distance assignment uncertainty. So a higher value of sigma means judges are very different, so they have higher assignment uncertainty. And what we find here this has a negative effect on, on loan volume. In contrast, the, the n effect of the third line, the more information we have about judges. The, there's a positive so The more information we have, there's less uncertainty about judges' types. So the lower the uncertainty, this has a positive effect on loan volumes. And then the last column, that means the closer we get towards the end, so the larger the fraction of the judges' term that has passed, the lower the loan volume. So there's more uncertainty getting closer towards the end because it becomes more and more likely now that, that any um, bankruptcy case will be handled by new judges that we don't want and then, I mean, to me personally, the most important evidence, or maybe the most direct evidence, is in columns two to four, we now split firms into risky and riskier and safer firms, where in the second column, the high risk firms, that is defined as firms with an interest coverage below two, so the low risk firms, those are firms with an interest coverage of high or higher, and the medium risk firms are those in between, so the interest coverage from two to five. And what you can basically see that the results are almost exclusively driven by the high risk firms. And that's kind of consistent with the idea that, well, which firms should care about this even uncertainty with respect to bankruptcy? So, well, those are the high risk firms that are most likely to be exposed to the bankruptcy. We also aggregate this at the, at the firm level. And then, so this is the, the last table that I want to show you. So I don't want to push the, you know, we don't want to push the interpretation here too hard, but the idea is to look at prices here to somehow disentangle a little bit the supply and demand effects. Why is this important? Because we have those predictions, you may recall, about the systematic and idiosyncratic sources of legal uncertainty. So in the context of, of bankruptcy law, the undiversified parties should be firms. Right? They probably go to the bankruptcy court at most once. So they really care about these synthetic uncertainty and which judge they're, they're going to be allocated to. In contrast, banks, they go to the bankruptcy court much more often, so they should be more diversified and care less about EU synthetic sources of legal uncertainty. So this so then EU synthetic sources of legal uncertainty should affect supply less relative to demand. So I will focus on the second column here, which is the, the riskiest forms that are pretty much trusting the result. So the first thing that we see is well when the um, when the in the court, when the court is more data friendly, interest rates are higher. That makes a lot of sense, so that's kind of comforting because if we have more data friendly courts, this should have a positive effect on the demand for credit, which, which drives up prices, but have a negative effect on the supply of credit, which should also drive up prices. So it's kind of comforting to see that for the mean effect, this is consistent that we see high interest rates. Now for the sigma, so for the assignment uncertainty, this is, I mean, banks are probably not perfectly diversified, but certainly firms are much less diversified than banks. So this, our, the prediction of the model would be that this is more affected by, by demand for credit, and the drop in prices is consistent. Right? If there would be a drop in the supply of credit, we would see that prices are going to go. But what we see is that prices are actually going down, which is more consistent with the, 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 the drop in loan volume that we saw in, in the previous table is rather driven by, by credit demand rather than supply. For the other two measures, so our N and our how, those are the systematic measures. So for the N, it's a little bit more tricky because here actually a lower value of N is higher uncertainty, right? If you have less information about judges, there's higher uncertainty. So 
the lower value of n leads to higher prices, and if we go closer to the sort of real point of mutual end, we also see higher prices, which is more consistent with their stronger supply. Okay. And, you know, again, I don't push it too much, it's more successive evidence, but at least it's consistent with the idea that credit supply, so the more diversified party here, is relatively more sensitive to the systematic tools of deep uncertainty, whereas credit demand is, is more um, relatively more sensitive to the EU's credit tools of deep uncertainty. So you may think about a lot of potential compounding factors, and I do not have time to talk about this. That's probably something we can talk about in the QA and in the QA part. Uh, at the end, so we try to really think about all the potential compounding factors that we can think about and try to provide some evidence that it's really the legal uncertainty that's, that's driving the results ourselves and not something that might be correlated with our legal uncertainty. So the last thing I, I want to talk about a little bit is, you know, why do we care about this and why is this important? What our results suggest that legal uncertainty has a negative effect on economic activity. So there are many policy implications. So if you think about the judicial system, it is random assignment of judges, or those frequent rotations, like in the Korean system, they generate a lot of legal uncertainty that is potentially harmful to economic activity. Um, in the legal system itself, this, you know, having more judicial discretion, I think in, you know, in, in, in legal philosophy, that's, that's also a big, big trade-off, right? We want to have some certainty, but at the same time, we also want to allow judges to have some dis discretion to take into account specific um, circumstances of an individual case. But our results suggest the more leeway we give to judges, the more uncertainty there may be, and that may be one of the things to, to, to also take into account when, when thinking about this, this trail. Legal precedent is actually sort of an interesting thing. On the one hand, legal precedent may reduce uncertainty because it sort of helps us to predict what's going to be the outcome of other cases, but it also makes it more systematic because now the outcome of one case also affects the outcome of other cases, right, if it's established precedent. So it's, it's sort of a double-edged sword. It can reduce legal uncertainty sort of on level-wise, but also make it more systematic harder to, to diversify. Maybe the last thing I will highlight here, we also have predictions on, on the boundary of the firm. Right, one thing is, well, being diversified here is good. You can get rid of the use and credit source of legal uncertainty. So the larger you are, the more cases you have, the higher your N is, the less you care about the use and credit uncertainty. And also if you're, if you're vertically or horizontally integrated, there may be fewer legal disputes in the first place. Right? If everything is internally in the firm rather than dealing with, with sort of outside firms, there may be fewer legal disputes in the, in the first place. And then there's a role for intermediation. We saw this with banks here, so banks care less about the tedious and credit uncertainty because they can be more diverse. There are insurance firms now that try to provide insurance for you know, legal risks. Also, there are, you know, things like um, law, lawyers or law firms that only pay if they win their case, right? That's also some form of kind of reducing the legal risk for, for individuals and for law firms to, to, to take on some of this. So that, that was kind of a, a very brief uh, summary of the paper. So the, the main things that I want to highlight to take away is that legal, to provide some empirical evidence that legal uncertainty reduces economic activity. And, and what we re only realized when we writing down the model and, and thinking through this is that there are really different sources of legal uncertainty. And we really have to think about to, to what extent are they systematic and we cannot diversify against, which makes them more severe and um, have, a, have a more adverse effect on, on economic activity. Or are there EU's and credit flows of legal uncertainty where depending on the market and the market participants, it may be possible to diversify against them and then they, they are going to be less detrimental. everybody, I'm Jia Min, and I'm from Madeira Eastern State University College of Law, and I'm, um, I'm it's, it's a great honor to be here, and um, so I thank for giving me the great opportunity to uh, come and discuss this great paper. So um, this paper, um, um, as for the show of our, um, uh, it's like that was presented to you, so this is a um, very rich paper. It, it was impossible to um, like uh, uh, summarize it, so I, I uh, kind of I just give, I will just uh, focus on the legal side of the paper. So overview: This is very insightful and informative paper in the sense that it has a way to it has a very fundamental question: How does legal uncertainty affect economic activity? And also, it develops a very noble like, theoretical model, and 
and introduce new types of idiosyncratic visual uncertainties, uh, specifically of incident uh, uncertainty because of the very unique uh, judges' rotation uh, clear, uh, every two years in Korea. So, and also it, comes, it provides an original data about the court, uh, Korean uh, bankruptcy uh, uh, cases. And also, uh, the, the authors are already known for a very sophisticated empirical uh, skills. And so, yet, uh, um, you can see the how detail, how sophisticated their uh, 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 empirical analysis uh, and, uh, are. And they provide a very great uh, findings, too, interesting findings, too. And also, it's an uh, inadequate, uh, it also contributes to both law, legal literature and the financial literature and um, also like, um, offers like, policy implications. So, um, there, are, uh, so uh, there are two types of legal uncertainties developed by the authors, an idiosyncratic and systematic, uh, versus systematic. And for, uh, so I, uh, this paper's uh, contributions, uh, contributions are more on the idiosyncratic um, uh, the legal uncertainties, and let me introduce, uh, let me explain a little bit more about the first two uh, types of uncertainties that the authors categorize as uh, idiosyncratic ones. So first one is assignment uncertainty. So judges uh, will be assigned to a cases that's very random. So that's an assignment of uncertainty, but that's not unique uh, in Korea. But the second one, the decision uncertainty, is EDNC credit in the sense that Korea's, um, in Korea, judges are uh, rotate the courts every two years. So they are due to the new um, a court, and then a court, and that's a kind of, uh, that's a relative, uh, that's a unique in Korea. So uh, because of, of that, those like legal uncertainties and EDNC credit uncertainties, it's a, uh, Hard for the debtor and then uh, the creditors to uh, um, so it, it causes it, it um, creates legal uncertainties for the um, for the debtors for both the debtor and creditors. So the authors try to see how those legal uncertainties, largely uh, based on the EDS and creating uncertainties, uh, have uh, have impact on the uh, the three different um, activities. The first one is about restructuring filings, and I'll tell you more about that, um, and the credit markets, and the firm investment. And then the authors found that uh, the greater legal uncertainties have negative impact on those three different types of activities. So let me tell you a little bit more about the um, restructuring filings, re restructured filings. So, this is kind of like a forum shopping. So this is very unique setting that the authors um, 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 made. So jurisdiction is determined by the in Korea, um, in Korea uh, the location of the debtor's principal office or place of business. So I will just, uh, refer, uh, I will just use the term principal office. So companies can file a restructuring petition with either the local district court of the principal office, or the district court in the city with a high court that has jurisdiction over the principal office. What do you see? So okay, so let's see the maps. So when if imagine that your um, so the filing so your principal office is in Suwon, it's still in the umbrella of the high court of the soul, which means that the debtors have choices. So they can either go with the Suwon, the local one, or using the high court that they have an option to file the, uh, a file with the soul court. But, imagine, but for the uh, companies, that have their principal office in Seoul, as you can see the, in the like, red box, that they have no choices. Least they have to go with Seoul, because even through the high court, court, the district court will be the same in the Seoul court. So the authors focus on the, um, the, the, uh, the, the companies that have choices of the two, and then uh, they try to see how 
the legal uncertainty or impact of the, the facts of their decision to um, to choose their uh, the court. Thank you. So, um, so, so the question is when companies can choose uh, then between the two, what affects their forum choices? So here, here's my first comment. So their data period that ranges from 2006 and 2015. And then the paper says that to ensure the consistency of the bankruptcy law and court system, we focus on the period of the, uh, 2006 and 2015. And because uh, in 2016, they implemented the new bankruptcy system, and 2015, the Korean bankruptcy court system underwent the institutional changes. So let me tell you a little bit more about that. So in 2006, um, uh, so in, on March 30, 31, 2006, there was a drastic um, uh, bankruptcy law reform in Korea, so which uh, um, combined the three uh, independent uh, bankruptcy-related um, laws um, were combined into the one, so now they, they had a unified one uh, bankruptcy law. So it's a, in terms of law, it was a drastic change uh, uh, in Korea. And um, in a sense, the authors, uh, two of the authors have a great, um, excellent paper on the events study uh, before and after uh, that legal change. And um, so, and in 2000, uh, on the other hand, in um, 2017, so there was a huge change in terms of court system. So that is that was the first time that Korea officially yeah, created uh, their specialty court, a specialty court which specialized in the bankruptcy and so. So, um, so I, I understand that the, the authors can't easily like a control the year uh, fixed effects, but uh, using the year fixed effects. But I when I was curious. Uh, if the uh, authors can say more about the impact of the legal change right after uh, the 2006, largely because, the, the, uh, partly because the New York, um, that the authors are talking about, the EDS incredible legal uncertainties, but during, uh, the right after, so right after the legal uh, law changes, it's possible that there can be a more systematic change that affects the, um, um, the, the judges. So, and the second comment is that how much discretion do judges have in Korea of bankruptcy cases? So, um, because um, the legal uncertainty is kind of implied that judges' um, preference is uncertain, right? And then that's, uh, that's why the creditors uh, or debtors need a time to learn about um, the preference of the judges. So, but how much discretion do they have? So, um, so the, the, the authors use six different types of decisions, and then depending on the answers, so um, um, that they coded either a debtor friendly or the creditor friendly. For instance, if the the judge accepts the case, then then it's a debtor friendly. Yeah, and then the dismissal. If the judge dismisses the case, then it's a creditor friendly. But um, my question is that should these decisions be having the, uh, the same amount of discretion? So um, based on, um, so it seems like some of them, uh, it, for some of those decisions, the judges have more discretion, but um, for the others, the judges um, the supply, the try to apply that law uh, rather than um, actually make a substantive um, the, um, evaluation. So is it, so question is, is it possible that, uh, that the difference in decisions are due to the difference in the quality of filings, filings in case the, some of the cases, some of the decisions are based on the mechanical application of the law. So let me give you the example. The first one is the judge's discretion to accept and dismiss the restructuring and filings. The, the, the paper says the first step in the review process is to determine whether the bankruptcy court at where the case was filed is what has a jurisdiction over the firm. That's the example of kind of like an application. So either whether the court, uh, whether it's, um, it's the right jurisdiction or not, it's just that 
um, you can have application of the law, so, but rather than the substantive review. But next, the judges assesses whether the firm has a realistic chance of surviving as a going concern and whether it's a contribution, a continuation value exceeds the liquidation value. But um, this is the new, um, this is the provisions uh, there are, uh, 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 the, from the law, the, the law, and it says the grounds for, it, it says, uh, it gives the grounds for the dismissing of application file before commencing the restructuring, uh, restructure procedures. So it seems like, um, and then based on the, the uh, conversation, uh, consultation with other judges, yeah. So um, it seems like, uh, so judges um, do not have like, plenty of like, discretion in deciding whether they have to accept or dismiss the cases. So um, it's, um, I'm not saying that it's a zero, or a one, zero, um, yes, just yes or no, but um, I, I'm, I'm curious how much like, the, the discussion they have. So if you can show what percentage of decision include uh, the, in the decision, include that we actually did assessment of the continuation value and the value, or, uh, so that would be really helpful to understand uh, the, whether they are exercising the um, discretion. And the second example is the judge's discretion to approve or uh, uh, reject the debtor's plan. So although, the, um, and then the paper says, that although the judge may consider the, uh, the creditor's vote, so they uh, approve the plan, restructure plan, or a restructuring plan or not, but it is not binding and it is ultimately up to the judge's discretion whether to approve or reject the plan. So, but, um, so yeah, so courts have the authority to reverse the creditor's rejection, uh, like a print down um, in like a, um, chapter 11 in the states. But um, but uh, but um, so but still, so it's a um, it's a uh, it's uh, I'm curious. Uh, if I'm, I want to know more about how often it happens. So when the creditors approve, then. I think that the judge has a little uh, an incentive to uh, reverse the, the plan, but when uh, they the creditors reject the plan, then how often it happens? Uh, how often judges actually approve or reverse that and approve that uh, plan? So uh, I uh, that would be really helpful to understand the picture of the uh, situation. And the comment three is uh, is about the prior experience with the bankruptcy cases. The paper says in particular judges are assigned to bankruptcy courts without prior experience in handling bankruptcy cases and are replaced by the other uh, judges at the end of their term of two years, which means that every two years the everything reset. Okay? But uh, the corporate restructuring cases should be decided by the, uh, the panel, like composed of the three judges, and including one like a senior judge. So you, the, the paper uses um, a base on paper is, is using like four uh, thousand six hundred eighty eight cases, and then I presume that they uh, they have like three judges for each one. But it seems a little uh, confusing to me how it's possible that uh, the we, almost nobody uh, the, the judges had a prior experience with bankruptcy bankruptcy um, cases of whatever they assigned. Um, to the new um, case. So if, if you so if you have like ID or um, identifier for the judges, so it would be really helpful to. Uh, I'm curious to know that how whether there are more experienced ones. Or, and then the fourth comment is that uh, is the mediating the legal uncertainty through collective institution or and and or institutional knowledge. So judges' rotation and random assignment of cases are not new, and then there has been a system in the court, grand court, that helps them to facilitate uh, the dealing with um, uh, the new assignments. So for bankruptcy court bankruptcy cases, judges closely refer to the uh, sole bankruptcy court's official, like a code of practice. Um, so this is official because we now, after since 2017, we have. Uh, sole bankruptcy court, but even before that, the manuals they had in the court was kind of um, or referred, um, uh, used as a reference, uh, a reference by the court, uh, judges in other courts. So this may, uh, this type of like more, um, 
So institutional memory or institutional knowledge can uh, may reduce the EU's <coughs> legal uncertainties at individual judge level. So I'm, I'm curious how does uh, such how um, does such institutional knowledge play out in your model? And the um, the fifth comment is that institutional replication. So I could find a one like a paper that actually it's a statistic shows the statistics that overlaps the uh, the period uh, the period uh, the, the period that overlaps with the, the one in this paper. But um, so and so um, this in even before the 2017 reform, as you can see, so um, the Seoul the Seoul court had a, yeah an average of like 30 percent of the cases each year, yeah. and um, so I think that it's possible. Like, so I'm curious whether and, and given that the court um, had a reputation for expert. That their expertise in dealing with bankruptcy cases, and especially like more like business friendly or creditor friendly, um, uh, in a in a better friend time, better friend way. So, um, just like a Delaware, like a chance report. So I'm curious whether um, the still full district court has <laughs> should be uh, treated um, differently. And the last comment is. Uh, whether the judge types are fixed. Oh, okay. so, so table four shows the judge type in the first half of the term tends to stay the same in the second half. So based on the paper's assumption, judges are new to bankruptcy cases. So I'm just curious and, um, how all of our judges type, whether either better friendly or uh, creditor friendly, um, the not affected by information and experience over the term. So, and um, in the theory, of the last kind is the uh, uh, low and maturity. Uh, maturity. So, uh, people like 10 uh, to like 15, in, uh, to think that the authors measure loan volume and interest coverage ratio. But I'm curious, uh, it's possible. I think that the greater uncertainty it should lead to the decrease in loan maturities because um, even the, the fact that the judges were paid every two years and, uh, and that uh, so the, if um, um, so the lenders can the banks can take that into consideration and they can negotiate their uh, loan maturities. So the conclusion. So I thoroughly enjoyed the paper and I learned so much. And I look forward to, uh, to the next paper on <laughs> the 2017 for system reform. So thank you so much for, uh, thank you so much again for listening. <laughs>
Judge Simon and the, the table that, that, that you put up here, I think that was quite convincing to us that really the, if we just really split the judge's term into two parts, into the first half and second half, you can really very precisely predict the judge's types and decisions in the second half based on the decision in the first half. So this seems to be something very persistent and not really driven by, by individual um, um, case characteristics. But I think it's a very important point. We thought about this a long time, sort of what is the right way to do this, and we really thought sort of probably this is the closest to sort of the perceived even uncertainty of the agents at the time, and we have some tests in the, in the paper to try also to, to back to, to provide additional evidence that we cannot find any evidence that firms and banks seem to know more. For example, one test that we do is we just assume that you know the banks and firms maybe they have more information. We just allow them to, to kind of observe all judges' decisions. So the fully informed judge type, we put this into the regression. So if banks and firms have more information, those fully informed types should already have some explanatory power earlier because banks and firms kind of should already know the type of the judges, but we find it has no explanatory power in, uh, on top of sort of this, this monthly updated measure. So for all that we can see and find in the data, it seems that the way that we classify sort of the simple, just you know, classifying every decision as, as better friendly or, or fragile friendly might be close to what people did at, at the time. That's sort of the main reason why, 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 why we went with this. But I think it's, it's a good idea because we talked about this discretion. We show this, we show the distribution that there's some variation in judges' types, but we could definitely do this descriptively decision by decision to see whether some of them maybe there's no variation because they don't have a lot of discretion, whereas for others there might be more. Let me just try a few questions and so I mean, Thank you. A couple of clarifying questions. One is, can we have some idea of the median time to default to make a point extreme? Assume that for every loan that's extended, default never arrives before month 24, then none of this would be happening. Right? By the time default arrives, the current composition of the board is absolutely irrelevant. Uh, so it would be useful to know a little bit more about how often default uh, arises by month 12, by time 6, and so forth. Uh, because those are the cases that are really right in your action. And I suppose you're recovering really attenuated estimates of the true dynamics that, that you're interested in. Uh, and second, I guess it's the, the one version of some of the discussion you and, and Guillaume have been having, which is what's your model for the common, common game? So you start with the assumption that the judge's preferences are the prior, the average, and then each time you see them decide, you update. How do you update? What's the weight you assign to that new decision? If there was no discretion whatsoever, the common gain should be zero. If there's a lot of dis discretion, well, the common gain should be something. But I, I would like to know what that something is now and whether the results are sensitive to that something. And finally, uh, you have a data from 2006 to 2023. If there was any evidence, cases of allocation of decisions became much swifter over time. So now you can quickly look at decided cases for a week after they are decided. Ten years ago, that was not the case. Maybe there's room for you to explain that by breaking down the sample period. Uh, and if indeed cases are published sooner now than, let's say, ten years ago, then you should see whether the results are uh, more powerful during the latter period than the earlier period. Just, just a quick question on the coding of uh, outcomes. Um, what makes you confident that approving a plan is always really a, uh, a data-friendly decision? Because first of all, who's the data here? It's probably equity holders. And if you have a plan that essentially wipes out equity holders and gives all the outside of the surviving venture to creditors, uh, it gets approved, but is that really a better friendly decision? And I would love to talk more about that uh, during coffee break, because I think that's really what's critical here. Uh, and you can probably make cases for all the coding that you do. Uh, so interesting paper. Um, I, one thing I want to um, smoke out a little bit on, though, is the fact is, is the question of to what extent are the creditors here contractually tethered to the debtor versus non-contractual claimants? Because if, if they're contractual claimants, then the legal uncertainty, at least as I understand the model, is essentially a risk that's going to be, or an uncertainty that's going to be borne by the two parties themselves. And that may have implications on how they design the contract and whether they, they have at their disposal contractual provisions 
that would essentially take out all of that economic risk. So I think about um, not only third-party insurance, but indemnity provisions, um, uh, leases, uh, you know, swaps and options and so forth. And, uh, and, it, and it kind of makes me wonder, to the extent that, that the contracting practice itself is relatively healthy, why does it t take all of this out, at least in terms of the model, right? Why wouldn't you and I just sort of say, okay, look, this is the type of judicial you know, scenario we're going to encounter. Let's figure out how you know, Eric and David can just you know, enter into some sort, of, uh, some sort of a set of cash flow obligations that are essentially contingent on the realization of that uncertainty. Is it, is it lack of foresight? Is it lack of faith that a, a court's going to even enforce that? I, um, I, I'd be interested in your thoughts about it. And, and, and in fact, I'll, I'll just try to turn that in, into a silver lining as well. That might give you some other, um, some other uh, uh, dimensions on which to test. You could sort of say, can I tip off, typify the firms that have the most contractual liability exposure versus non-contract claimant, like tort type claimant, um, uh, exposure, in which you'd expect the, the effect should be stronger with that second group. And then if you have access to the contractual forms themselves, they should be evolving in a way that's totally consistent with uh, with the predictions in the model. So that gives you another couple things to at least confirmatory hypotheses that you might be able to grab onto in the spirit of giving you more work. Yeah. Um, I was trying to think about the social welfare policy implications of this, you know, thinking about it from a general equilibrium point of view, and you know, sort of simplifying your model a little bit. Uh, uh, so let's say that banks have no idiosyncratic risk; it's uh, it's, it's all systematic uh, risk. So that the third, that would suggest the total loan value volume would be constant, then for a given firm at a point of time, then I think what your results are suggesting is greater idiosyncratic uncertainty leads to lower um, real investment. That's a factor which is completely irrelevant to um, the underlying uh, expected cash flows from that um, real investment. So it would seem to me that the policy implication here is that it's more important to have the, the level of idiosyncratic uncertainty be even among firms rather than that it be low because it's going to have sort of the same, uh, the same, the same influence. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about distributing uh, a total amount among a group of firms and here's a factor that affects things that is irrelevant to the expected cash flow. Okay, over there, I think we can Thanks. Uh, wondering if you've thought at all about settlement. Uh, and one way you could test that a bit. So the idea being that a lot of the effects, uh, and there's a long literature that I could point you to will, will happen in a way that you don't see. Just uh, like we know what the court looks like and so we settle uh, around the, the, uh, the court. And uh, one way you can look at this is just like looking at the number of cases. Uh, and you might imagine if people hate uncertainty, for example, then they may always settle. Uh, and you would see a change in the number of bankruptcy filings or something along those lines, but that's another dimension on which, uh, on which things might change. I wonder why you're clustering at the firm level and not at the district level. It seems to me that the treatment is applied at the district level, so it should be less of it. So David, when I'm in a Data friendly system from the bank's perspective, shouldn't I be very glad about the uncertainty and be willing to learn more because we can only become better for me? Yeah, so I thought the assignment of the court was very clear and the distribution of types of judges was also very clear, but I didn't quite understand how when you sign the loan, how you know which judge is going to be assigned to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
much more crazy question. I just wondered if you could pronounce for slow people like me uh, what the uh, remaining identifying variation is after the fixed effects. So the time fixed effects and the fixed effects and just like time fixed effects. I I got a little dizzy in my head just trying to think about. Okay. So what's the ideal thought experiment? Basically? All right. Well, then so, uh, you can respond to all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I think some of this we have to talk about uh, over a coffee break or, or, or something. We could, yeah, it's just a lot of things. So let me start in the beginning all the things that I, that I can remember and that I can read on, on my quick notes. So uh, about the weights, the weights and the, and the updating. So we, we do a robustness, we have a table in there. So basically the way it works in this beta distribution that, that we use, so the way that you assign your prior is as if you observe X number of observations. Right? And let's say your prior, the strength of your prior is as if I observe 10 observations, then I'm updating probably more quickly. If the prior is as if I already observed 50 observations, I'm updating. So and we try to provide some robustness on this. That it doesn't matter too much. The only thing I can say which makes the results very noisy is if our prior is really weak, because then it fluctuates like you know, crazy in the beginning, and then the results become a bit more noisy. But if we have a sort of minimum level, I think five decisions we need at least for the strength of the prior, then it becomes quite robust to do this assumption. Yeah, this idea with the with the whether the effect is getting stronger over time, if over time the, the agents would be able to observe this better more quickly, I think that's, that's the idea we could certainly look at this. And probably think it's a reasonable assumption that it should get easier over time, so we can just see whether the results get stronger in the second half of the sample compared to the first, for example. Um, Sorry, I cannot read my own handwriting. So the sample, the sample one says actually for that idea, we actually have a table, I didn't have time to present this, where we show exactly this effect. That when there's more uncertainty, actually there are less fewer bodies in this court. Particularly those firms that can choose between two courts, then they always go to the court where there's less uncertainty. So we see that when they can choose, there's more the uncertainty, but even the level even firms who cannot choose, there are less, there are fewer findings. So it is consistent with the idea that they want to go to the court when, when the uncertainty is higher. Um, the, yeah, I, I agree with the, the clustering. I mean, we have only 40, 40 districts, so we need a more sophisticated econometric uh, uh, yeah, way of, of doing the clustering with those few clusters. But yeah, we can also do some robustness on this. I'm not sure whether more uncertainty is better when we are in, in a level, sort of a lower level of, of data friendliness or, or data friendliness from, from a bank perspective. I mean, things still can get worse. It probably it depends a little bit on what is kind of the level where, where really banks or firms or, or shareholders would be washed out and then yeah at some point there will be some sort of flipping where then uncertainty becomes a good thing. We haven't thought about this but maybe we can think about this. Can think about this more. What is the, the remaining variation? So the remaining variation is that uh, you can think about there are two firms that are both in the same court zone, which was like the picture that, that we saw in the discussion, like you're in two one or in, in Seoul. And then the the, the, the so so called might have a high degree of uncertainty, the Suwon called might have a low degree of uncertainty at a given point in time, and then we compare whether those whether the credit um, provision to firms in Suwon or compared to so on, how this is, is different depending on the only uncertainty across the course. Yeah, so when when you when you make a decision right to provide credit to a firm, you only know which court is going to be charged, but you don't know those charge, which is exactly the speed uncertainty, right? First of all, if there are multiple judges in the court, I don't know which judges are going to be assigned to. And that was also the question earlier. Well, depending on when the default is going to occur, it may even be that it's a new new team of judges that, that will handle the case. So that's, those are some of the sources of big uncertainty that we don't know those things. So there's a good point. There are actually tables from things like you know Moody's and so on, right? That always provide some default um, that the probability of different for right for different ratings. What we haven't looked at, and I think that's, that's something very valuable to do, also to sort of scale the effect and understand right, how much is the actual legal exposure, sort of legal uncertainty that they're exposed to, and to look at sort of maybe from the time of allocating the loan was than the average time of default. So maybe the, yeah, so that's maybe the last thing I will talk about, and then we have to talk about the later of the, 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 the coffee break is sort of the, is it important the level of legal uncertainty or, or how different the legal uncertainty is across different firms? I think it depends a little bit on how we think about right, the sort of credit markets. If there's a fixed pot, 
then it's true that if there are different levels of uncertainty that leads to this distortion of the allocation. If we really think about, you know, there's no funding constraint, then really the level just determines how much credit is going to be allocated, how much production there's going to be, and the level is also important to depend a little bit on yeah, how, how flexible we think that the, the, the credit supply is, so how much is really just about allocation. And then the last one is about the contractual, um, so how much is contractual and how contracts would respond to this, we can talk a little bit about this, but definitely our model is not an optimal contracting model, you're right. In, in our model, we could undo everything with sort of side contracts and things like that. That's that issue. So it's not an optimal contracting model. In that sense, and to what extent we can link this to the data, this idea is something to, to think about because, as you said, that provides additional variation to sustain the, the empirical evidence. Um, which, how do we classify this into better friendly, predator friendly? So, I agree that you could probably make up cases where for many of, of those decisions, you know, maybe there can be some exceptional cases where it goes the other way, but I think on average it should be sort of sensible the way that we classify this. For the specific comment about the plan, those are this is similar to chapter 11 in the US, because those are really plans suggested by the management. So then if the judge goes with the plan of the management, it tends to be more data friendly. I agree with you that there can be exceptional cases where this may not be the case, but I think on average it's probably. Any other questions? Okay, so if not, I think that uh, we can finish the competition. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, so as you can see, this is a paper about outside director finger limit. Uh, the reason I was able to do this was uh, there was a government intervention. There was an announcement that Korean uh, outside directors they cannot uh, go beyond a certain year. Uh, this is a core with my current and my past doctor students, and this is my research question. Um, so I'm looking at the effect, the effect of limiting the tenure of outside directors, uh, basically the effect of removing long-term outside directors on two outcome variables. One would be you know, the market valuation, so I'll be doing some event study, and the voting behavior. Um, so when it comes to outside director tenure and uh, the board effectiveness, uh, there are two contrasting views. Uh, one is called the um, expertise in Aspen view, basically saying that the more you spend time as an outside director in the firm, uh, you know more about the company, and therefore you'll be able to carry out your uh, monitoring and advising tasks uh, as, as one view. Uh, the opposite view is if you stay too long, well, you're going to be, you know, indifferent to the shareholders, but uh, you'll be more aligned with the management, so uh, the board effectiveness will actually fall. Okay, so those are the two contrasting views, and uh, I'm trying to test which one uh, dominates the other. I'm not saying that one will exist and the other one will not exist, I'm just going to try to see which one dominates and which one will be more uh, dominant in certain circumstances. Um, so let me just give you the summary of the key results. So what I do find is that the entrenchment uh, effect is uh, greater, it's more dominant than the expertise uh, enhancement view. And uh, I back it up with uh, two uh, evidence. One is uh, the share price uh, reacted very favorably uh, when the government announced that they will be limiting the, the tenure. And also uh, this uh, is going to be uh, more pronounced in firms that uh, have a very poor corporate governance uh, because you know these are the ones that are more entrenched and uh, limiting the tenure will be more effective. Uh, and then I try to uh, see why there's a favorable uh, stock price reaction by looking at the actual voting uh, decisions made by individual uh, directors. And uh, I do find that uh, because after this, uh, the tenure limit, uh, the descent rates and the abstention rates actually rise, and I find three channels. One is um, because you're removing long-term outside directors, which has been uh, showing very low descent rates, and uh, you're bringing in new outside directors, which I find that they show much higher descent rates, and also because uh, the term will be, in effect, limiting the directors to stay only six years, uh, so for those who have a term of three years, this means that they can only serve two terms. 
And uh, the second term directors, knowing that they cannot be reelected again, they don't have to be really friendly to the management, so they show a much higher uh, disagreement. So uh, I find these uh, three channels. Okay, so what's the detail of the rule? Um, the rule says you cannot be reelected as an outside director if you have uh, served the company for uh, already six years. Or because many of the current firms are affiliated to business group, you cannot be reelected again if you have served in the same business group for nine years. So we have a six year rule and a nine uh, year rule. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to define LTOD, long term outside directors. These are the ones who have spent six years in a given firm or nine years in a given uh, business group. Um, so in fact, for three year term outside directors, they can serve only two terms. Um, what's important about the career rule is that you cannot regain eligibility uh, after a cooling off period. I know that in India and Israel, if you uh, are outside, if you step down from the board and then you spend like a certain year, you can come back to the same company. Uh, so the Korean rule is more strict, uh, I would say. And then some other minor uh, rules, like uh, if, uh, like concurrent positions, you can take concurrent positions in the same business group, that will not be double counted, and also, uh, if the company went through a merger or split, the, the time you spent as an outside director before you split or the merger will be counted in a uh, way calculating six years in Okay, so because I'll be doing uh, events that the uh, dates are reported, so, uh, so it happened in uh, September 5th, 2019, uh, the government announced that they will be imposing a limit. This was unexpected. Uh, I've been following Korean corporate governance for the past 20 years, uh, I, I did not predict this to come. So this is a good event uh, to conduct the uh, study. And then um, there was an initial amendment release uh, on September 24th, but uh, there was a prominent in the press saying that the effective date, the effective date will not be uh, the, the, the following year, 2020, but it could be postponed to 2020. So, so there was some uncertainty regarding the, the effective date, but uh, on January 14th, 2020, the government uh, finally fixed this. Uh, they announced that the effective date will be uh, the following years in June. Um, so any uh, long-term outside directors, by that time, the following years in June, they would have to step down. Um, but uh, I'll tell you in a moment, uh, but uh, even if you have spent like six years or nine years, um, there are reasons that you may be able to remain in the board, even if you're classified as long-term outside director. So we'll go over that in a moment. Um, there was some uncertainty whether long-term outside directors will actually step down or not, and that can be confirmed only at the, uh, the following year's teaching. So this will be an independent uh, event as well. Um, so here, uh, I show you uh, the actual removal of, of LTOPs. You may think that if you are an LTOP, has, has spent six years and nine years, you would have to step down, but that's not the case. Uh, here you can see that um, at the time there were 300, like 3,669 uh, 3, uh, outside directors, and uh, 800 of them were LTOPs, but the only ones that stepped down were 386, um, even less than half. So what's going on here? Um, that is because the rule says you cannot be re-elected. It doesn't mean that you have to immediately step down from the board. So those outside directors whose term has not expired yet, they don't have to step step down. They will step down only when their term expires. So a significant fraction of the LTOGs did not step down on uh, 2020 AGM. And also there are some exceptional cases where your term can actually be extended. Uh, one is uh, it has to do with audit committee members in Korea. If the company fails to elect the successor, uh, there's a commercial code provision saying that the predecessor can still stay along with the company until the successor has been appointed. So uh, when it comes to audit committee members, there was an uncertainty at the time when the rule was introduced whether they would actually step down or linger longer uh, in the company. And then uh, there were some uh, interesting companies which amended the corporate charter so that uh, their directors had three-year terms. They changed the corporate charter so that they have a three-year term, so that they can stay for one more year. 
So there were some uh, observers, and then some companies just got mixed up. They didn't fully understand the rules, so they had to stay in law. Uh, so there were some uncertainties and some uh, exceptional cases, uh, which makes me uh, my third event uh, of value detection. So only at the 2020 HM you would know for sure who would step down and who would not. Okay, um, so I have two sets of hypotheses. One has to do with the market valuation. The other one has to do with voting. Okay. Uh, when it comes to stock market rea uh, reaction, I, I look at whether the stock price uh, rises when the rule has been introduced for the companies that do have LTOBs, right? So what I do is I have firms with LTOBs and I have matching firms without LTOBs. I make a comparison between the two. And then I try to see whether the, the general level of corporate governance makes a, a difference. And my uh, prediction is that for those firms uh, with very low corporate governance scores, these are the ones where the entrenchment effect will be higher which means that the rule will have a much greater impact. And then, uh, as I told you, I look at the third event, I, I try to see uh, what happens when uh, the audit committee members actually step down. Um, when it comes to voting decisions, um, uh, I do uh, three things. One is I compare the voting uh, decisions, in particular the descent rates and the abstention rates of those LPODs, uh, and uh, the other uh, outside directors. So these are uh, the directors who spend less time in the company. I compare their uh, voting behavior and try to see whether LTODs has been descended less. And also I look at newly elected outside directors who would be a replacement of the LTODs and see whether their descent rates are higher than the outgoing LTODs. And uh, as I have told you, I will also look at uh, how uh, the second term uh, director's voting behavior would be different. Uh, but this is not my uh, new idea. This has already been studied by Zhang Wang and Zhao in 2016. Um, sample construction, so I look at uh, 637 companies at, uh, at the time of the 2020 HM, which has an LTO. So this is going to be the basic uh, sample that I will be uh, looking at. Uh, voting decision data, this is not available in many countries. Uh, I know China has this uh, and Korea has this. I know only of these two countries. Um, so this uh, is hand collected from HM convocation notices. And if you look at the Korean convocation notice, uh, it will list all the uh, proposals uh, discussed at the board and also the voting decisions by individual uh, directors. So I'm making use of that data. So here's the result. Uh, event one. So this is the day uh, when the government first announced um, uh, the rule. And uh, so here you can see, let's see if I have a point Yeah, right here. You can see it's positive and statistically significant, meaning that uh, the entrenchment entrenchment effect is greater than the uh, the expertise announcement effect. But uh, the magnitude is quite small. It's like one percent, like one point seven percent. But if you look at the regression models in column five and six, uh, where I interact uh, the KCGI scores, uh, you can see that the magnitude is jump, and uh, let me give you the interpretation. So if KCGI is so this is you know firms with very low corporate tolerance, the, the initial price jumps by 7.35%. So that's a huge jump. And uh, if you look at the firms with uh, CGI of five, this is a really advanced company, it drops. So for these companies, I think what's going on is the, the expertise enhancement effect of long-term outside directors are greater. So uh, forcing them to step down actually hurts uh, the firm value. Um, and then for event number two, event number two is when the government uh, made sure that when it will be effective. Uh, and uh, the overall coefficients are, again, very small. But if you look at the interaction terms and uh, the coefficients on LTOD in column five and six. Again, uh, similar results uh, shows up. And what's more interesting is uh, the effect does not show up for those long-term directors whose uh, term will not expire at 2028. So these are the ones who will stay longer for various reasons. And uh, the effect shows up only for those that will, you know, for sure, who will step down uh, at the following year's aging. Um, event number three, uh, I look at uh, the actual um, uh, res resignation. 
And uh, I do not see anything from non-audit committee members. This is expected because we already knew uh, way before that they would have to step down. Uh, those who, uh, where there's uncertainty is only those uh, audit committee members. And uh, uh, share price jumps significantly. And uh, there were some rare cases where they actually extended term. I told you uh, they didn't fully understand the rule or they changed the corporate charter to two to three years. And uh, it does drop a lot. It's just that uh, it's not specifically significant because I only have an eight sample. Uh, but it, it does drop a lot. And uh, regression result. Um, so here uh, I, I try to see what happens when uh, long-term outside directors who have been serving at the audit committee actually steps out. So the, this was not certain until then, but when it was uh, made that they did actually uh, resign uh, share price jumps. And uh, you can see that uh, column four, the interaction term is also uh, significant. And uh, first, uh, small number of firms that actually stand it, you can see that share price drops here. Uh, in multivariate regression, uh, it's statistically significant. Okay, uh, voting decision. So this is a bar chart showing you uh, what happens to uh, long-term directors, long-term outside directors, uh, and uh, other directors. The, the left bar chart is only looking at the descent, and uh, the right-hand side bar chart uh, combines the descent and the abstention. Abstention is, uh, in effect, same as the descent because you are present, but you don't vote, which means that it's going to make it harder for the company to meet the court. Right? So it's basically same as descent. So, uh, you can see that uh, long-term outside directors has been dissented much less than other uh, short-term outside directors. And then uh, the regression result also uh, confirms my result, uh, negative, statistically significant. Uh, you may be concerned with a very small coefficient here, uh, negative 0 0.00074. That's because the descent rate itself is very low. So if you compare this with the average descent rate, uh, the average descent rate is 0 0.0011. Compared to that, uh, this, this drop is significant. It's a 67.3% uh, drop in the descent rates. So I think it's also economically significant. And then here, I, I compare long-term outside directors with newly elected outside directors. So these are the new outside directors coming into the company, and they show, interestingly, a much higher uh, descent rate. Right? Um, and then the regression result also confirms the result. And uh, again, uh, the average is low, uh, which makes the, uh, the, the drop in the uh, descent rate economically significant. And then what I do is I try to see what uh, happens to the voting behavior of uh, uh, second-term outside directors. And uh, here you can see that it jumps a lot, right? Um, in 2021, uh, it's uh, 0.598. So I was really happy to see this result, but I was really disappointed when I uh, plotted the first term outside director. They also did this. So I cannot really say that uh, the, limit, uh, the outside director can limit will cause uh, second term outside director to descend uh, more. So uh, I, I was not able to confirm the result of uh, uh, Wei Zhang's paper. Um, and then also, when I did the dynamic DID, that was not uh, statistically significant. Uh, so let me conclude. My contribution, this, the contribution of the paper is that this is, I think, is the first paper that uh, studies the uh, effect of limiting the outside director tenure on firm valuation and the voting behavior. Uh, most of the papers look at, they, they don't focus on the outside director tenure limit. They look at the tenure and other outcome variables. Uh, the only paper I know that has studied the tenure limit rule, rule is the, the Jones paper, uh, but they didn't look at like firm valuation or boring behavior of uh, other directors. They only look at second term outside directors compared to first term outside directors. And I, I think I understand it's a causal relationship uh, between the two. So thank you. that's been heavily debated in the United States. In the United States, 
the individual terms of directors are limited to three years in Delaware, but directors can serve, in, can serve an infinite number of terms. So it's an interesting issue that I haven't thought, thought much about. Um, the main contribution of the paper, of course, is to use this positively exogenous change to the law of director tenure and to examine whether limiting director's tenures is, is ultimately good or bad for stockholders. There's two methods, an event study and also a comparison of descent rates. I'll talk about each of them. Um, I think that the implications of this paper are pretty interesting. They're probably more interesting for economies like Korea's in which corporate control tends to be highly concentrated and maybe a little less interesting for economies like the United States or the United Kingdom in which corporate control is more diffuse. In the United States, of course, we have independent directors as well, but we tend to judge independence relative to management, whereas in economies like Korea's with concentrated ownership, my understanding, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that independence is judged relative to both management and to the controlling stockholder. And arguably, the influence and importance of outside directors is greater when a company is dominated by a controlling stockholder than when control is held diffusely. Or at least it's just different and interesting in uh, certain ways. Um, the data on voting especially is very, very interesting. Um, I wasn't aware that any country in the world required reporting of an individual director to votes, votes on individual matters. It's really fascinating. So um, I want to talk about exactly what the paper says and what it doesn't say. These are not criticisms of the paper so much as just an effort to understand precisely what it can and can't say. Every paper is capable of saying some things and not others. So I just want to talk about, uh, really specifically about what we can take away here. Um, so the first thing I want to point out is that um, the first event, as the paper makes clear, was pretty heavily confounded by the simultaneous announcement of other corporate reforms at the same time. Now, I don't know what those are. I would invite Muchan to tell us a little bit more about what they are. But it's possible, maybe, that they were really important and that those other events were driving the results around the first event there. Um, those other events didn't confound the other two event dates, which is why I think the inclusion of those other two event dates is important. But it does mean that this first event date has to be understood and approached very carefully. Um, another thing I want to point out is that there's not a true control in the event studies. And the reason is every listed company was affected by the policy. Um, so what we're really looking at here, the main result is the comparison between whether a company currently had um, an LTOD director, or whether it currently did not. But bear in mind that any company could have an LTOD director in the future. So even if I currently have a director who served only four years, I'm still affected by the policy in the sense that two years from now, that director will be term limited. Or let's say two years. Four years from now, the director will be term limited. Um, that's not necessarily a problem. It just means that we have to understand these results carefully. What these results are is a comparison between the effect on companies that were, hit, that, were, that were affected immediately and the effect on companies that would be affected in the future. Um, what it's not is a comparison of companies that were affected in general and companies that were not. We have no way to understand the overall effect of the policy. And since stock prices today reflect the discount of present value of everything that's expected to happen in the company in the future, the fact that a director might be term limited in the future might be just as important as the fact that a, factor, that a director is affected today. As a result, these um, results probably understate somewhat, we don't know how much, but somewhat the overall level of the effect since every company in these results was affected to some degree or another. Um, I also think that the interactions with the corporate governance ratings are really, really interesting because you can see that that's by far the largest economic magnitude. When we interact the presence of an LTOD direct director today with the corporate governance ratings, we get some just astonishingly large returns. What I would like to see is a specification that includes just the corporate governance ratings, but not um, the the, exist the, 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 the variables that indicate the existence 
of an LTOD director. The closest we come is this specification here. And interestingly, the CGI ratings are not important. It's kind of curious that these interactions are soaking up all the significance of the CGI ratings and doing it to an extraordinary degree. Even though all that's happening in the interaction is what appears to be the relatively minor difference between companies that currently have a term limited director, director and ones that might have a term limited director three years from now. Um, so that brings me to another thing that's important to understand carefully, which is that, of course, there can be that the existence of a term limited director is not the only difference between the companies that have those directors and the companies that don't. It may well be the case that term limited directors, the presence or absence of term limited directors, is correlated with a thousand other variables. Um, that's especially important because those thousand other variables could in turn be correlated with response to the other changes in corporate governance that were announced the same day as this first event. As a result, it can be a little bit challenging to know exactly what was the effect of the term limited directors and the other character unseen, unspecified characteristics that might have been correlated with the presence of term limited directors. Um, Let's also just look at the, um, the voting decision data. So this, I think, is in some ways the most interesting result here. What we have is the average descent rates compared for the long tenure directors and those who were newly elected to replace them. On the left, we have just the descents. On the right, we have the descents plus the abstentions. I don't know exactly how an abstention differs from the descent, but I think Wuchan's telling us they're pretty similar. A couple of things. First, as Wuchan pointed out, the descent rates are incredibly low. I mean, not incredibly low, actually predictably low. I mean, those of you who have been on any sort of decision-making body know that descent is a pretty extreme thing when you're working with small groups of repeat players. Um, so just a couple of observations about that. One is this could be well within the range of normal statistical variation given the small size. Another is that we could actually interpret these results a little differently and say that dissent is actually a measure of lack of influence rather than influence, right? So, so even if I'm not firmly in the majority, it may be a measure of influence if I'm capable of treating compromise for my vote. In other words, I might be more influential if I vote with the majority and compromise than if I go to the extreme measure of dissenting. One of the ways that you know an SEC commissioner doesn't have any influence is that you file dissents. Um, another thing I want to point out is that we're not actually just comparing the decisions of two groups of people here. We're actually comparing the decisions across two different time periods. We're comparing the decisions of the long tenure directors in 2018 and 2019 to the decisions of the new directors in 2020 and 2021, right? These are the people who were booted out of office. These are the people who replaced them. And so they're two different time periods. As a result, we're really comparing two things, different people and different time periods, making it difficult to know whether what we're looking at is an effect of people or time periods. It's especially important to understand that limitation because, again, there were other corporate governance reforms, as I understand, announced around the same time, making it possible that those other reforms changed the overall ecosystem of corporate governance in a way that might have made dissent more attractive. Um, another thing I want to just point out, this is less a, a, a point about understanding the, 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 the paper than just a, um, a kind of interesting observation, is that um, it's possible that um, Tenure could actually make directors more independent. For the same reason tenure is supposed to make judges and academics independent, one could argue that it would make directors more independent. Um, one could imagine, for example, that if controlling stockholders had a high degree of influence over directors' re-election, um, and that, that influence could be more strongly exercised when there wasn't an incumbent director that had a presumption of continuation, that actually shortening terms might diminish the independence of directors. And so one of the things that I like about this paper is that 
it takes what's clearly an empirical question uh, and tries to give it empirical answers. Uh, it's a nice setup in that respect. Um, I should I want to observe though that probably the controlling stockholders influence over re-election is not that great because apparently under Korean law the nominating committees for new outside directors have to be comprised of two-thirds outside directors. So let me just close by asking a handful of questions that might be worth thinking about either in future iterations of the paper or just in conversation. So one is, of course, what exactly were those other reforms announced around the same time as this policy? Another is I just would like to know what exactly qualifies a director as being outside. I've assumed that a director has to be independent, not merely from management, but also from the controlling stockholder. Is that correct? Um, another question is, how are outside directors elected? Do the controlling stockholders get a vote? Because if they do, you know, that, of course, diminishes the degree of independence. I assume they do. It's just sort of an interesting thing to think about. Um, a couple of bigger questions. Um, and then I'll close. I don't think these necessarily should be addressed in the paper, just things to think about. One is, if this reform was indeed value enhancing, why wasn't it done previously? Presumably the answer is just the, the kind of usual problem of corporate governance in which a controller gets all of the private benefits of control, but only a portion of the benefits of the governance. And then another question that I don't have an answer to, but which I want to think about for myself is, would this work in the United States or Japan or the United Kingdom or another country with more diffuse corporate governance? I don't know. And one of the things that I most enjoyed about reading this paper was the chance to contemplate how this reform might integrate with other legal uh, systems and economic ecosystems. Thank you. Okay. Um, so thank you, John, for all the um, kind, well, detailed and uh, constructive uh, comments. Uh, your first question was, um, would it be different uh, because uh, Korea has a controlling uh, shareholder, and uh, would it be different in other uh, countries, in, which is also your last comment? And um, I haven't really thought about this. I just, uh, you know, focus on Korea and. Uh, I just assume that uh, it would be just the same in other countries, but uh, I think that's an interesting question that you're posing to me, and uh, I'll uh, think about it. Um, other policies that has been introduced on that day, September uh, 2019, um, unfortunately, I don't remember all of them, and it's been a while, I wrote this paper, but um, regarding the board, uh, there was one substantive uh, reform. Um, so in many of the cases in Korea, many of the firms, uh, former executives of the same company, uh, after a two-year cooling off period, they can come back as an outside director of the same company. That was the rule. Uh, the cooling off period has been extended from two years to three years. Uh, I didn't really see that as a major reform. And uh, I'm sure there were many others, but unfortunately, I, I cannot think of it uh, at the top of my head. Um, and then, um, I, yeah, so your fourth comment was really interesting. I don't have a true control. So in the future, uh, these my control, the matching firms, without the LTODs, they may also be affected. They won't be able to you know, keep their you know, directors. They'll have to let go of them. So in that sense, um, my coefficients, the impact, may be actually understating the effect. I, I, I think that may be the case. So uh, maybe I, I should write that down in my uh, paper next, in my next revision. Um, and then um, I think you talked about um, like uh, other variables that may vary with um, LTOD. So I try to include as many control variables. Um, and uh, this is not a time of event study, so I couldn't put in uh, for the fixed effect. I just included industry, uh, industry fixed effects try to do my best, but I'm, I'm sure there will be some other um, effects taking place at the same time. Um, and then you made a very interesting comment that dissent itself may be a proof that you're not really influential, right? If you're really influential, you would make sure that the management you know, drop the proposal before actually proposing it to the board, right? That's, uh, that could be true. 
Uh, so the dissent means that he actually failed and he just wanted to you know, say something uh, just for the record. Uh, maybe that is the case, but still, uh, I, I, I find your first comment that in a very repeated game, if you're, if you're uh, staying with the same guys for a long period of time, the setting is an is a exceptional event. And uh, in, given my understanding about current co corporate governance, this is a very courageous act. Uh, and uh, this, uh, the dissent itself actually signals uh, many things. Um, and then, uh, yes, I, 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 I agree that uh, there's a time difference. Uh, when I compare the voting behaviors of LTOBs and uh, newly elected outside directors, there was a time difference. It's inevitable because I have to match with their replacement. Uh, but there could be something else going on, for example. What if the dissent rates in Korean board uh, for some other reasons just rising, right? Then you elected outside directors, their dissent rates will have to be higher, not just because they're more independent, maybe just the trend. Yes, so I, I buy that uh, limitation. And then you mentioned about tenure, like tenure for professors, judges, but uh, uh, my argument here is that, well, the tenure is not guaranteed. You will only be able to extend your tenure uh, when uh, you're, you're selected by the control shareholder or the management to continue uh, your service. Um, nominating committee, well, in Korea, uh, the outside director nomination committee, uh, that's there, but uh, um, some firms, some small number of firms may be effective, but uh, the majority of the companies, it's not really, you know, they're not really independent. That's my understanding, and I'm sure most of the Korean uh, academics here agree. Um, uh, yeah, I think uh, I, I uh, answered most of your questions, and uh, we could have a talk after the break. Wow, there are a bunch of questions. I'm glad you picked it. Can you ask me a question? You used the word removal of the letter. Were you meaning removal as in the term ends and they're just not reappointed? Or are they removed before the end of the term? Because if it's a latter, then I imagine that the moment they start dissenting, the controlling shareholders can effectively remove those directors, kind of rebalancing this whole thing. So that maybe uh, if you could clarify the expression of removal. Oh, when I showed you the table, uh, title as removal, uh, it was uh, those uh, directors who stepped down on uh, the March of 2020 AGM. Um, so, and then I told you that uh, not all of them were removed. And that was because the term has not been expired. So removal here means that LT, they are LTOBs, and their term has expired by 2020. So that that's constitutes a removal. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Disapproval is the right proxy measure for independence because, as, you, as, as John mentioned, um, we have a tendency that if there's a possibility that the board will not approve the agenda, the uh, employees will not raise to the board at all. So maybe uh, the number of agenda which is raised to the board is a, a better uh, proxy for the independence because obviously if the number of agenda decreases, it means that they did monitoring much better and then like the people in raise the board that way. But that's what my one point. The second point is that regarding the share price uh, change, I think that usually new legislation was a strong signal about uh, the change of the government about the uh, beneficial protection, investor protection in general. And in hindsight, actually, there were many series of new reform empowering the minority shareholders. So I'm not sure whether we can say that this rule change has contributed to the um, share price increase at the, at the announcement because not only the event but there was a series of new events following up which was a very clear message that the government will be much more friendly to invest in the market share. Right, so okay, I should take questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, um, uh, so, two observations. The first is that the long term outside the rest tend to be more socially tied to the controlling shareholders. Quite often they will have gone to either the same high school or university, whereas then 
yeah, uh, the new coming ones may be different. So that might be perhaps driving the results. So maybe looking at whether the strength of social tie changes before and after this legislation with regards to who left and who came in. That might be helpful. And the second thing is that we know that in many Korean companies, the attendance of second-term directors can be different from the person. Not, not always, but like, attendance has been a bit of an issue and there's been a push towards driving that up. So that's normally a good measure of monitoring. So I'm trying to see whether there's a noticeable change in the attendance between these um, long-term and newly elected members. So I want to go back to some of your discussion with John. So the control from the effects of, of the treatment of those firms is like, and it's an attenuated version of the effect you are picking up from your treatment firms. So it would be good to see whether the control firms were also, so do they experience scars of significant magnitude that's so far opaque, hidden within the fixed effects? But it would be nice to check as a sanity check whether those results are there as well for these more attenuated predict firms. Uh, the ones that didn't have long-term directors at that point. And so I was curious about the economic magnitude. I, I think it's a little bit too much, if I should say. So we have multiple events, three events, each of which trigger when you identify the intensive, I'm sorry, the extensive margin, uh, high single digit cars. What do shareholders expect these newly elected directors uh, will be able to do that a firm that nonetheless has a controlling shareholder. Is it possible to believe that the fact that these long-term directors have been blacked out and they will be replaced by someone else at a firm that still remains controlled could bring about enhancements in firm value of, I don't know, 20%? Is it even within the realm of the conceivable? Hi, interesting paper, always. Um, related to the earlier comments, Abstract um, statistical version of the comment about the confounding events, which is that 
is I mean, we meant it's the same day for all these terms that are treated or half treated or whatever. So usually it would be good to see a portfolio regression where you get the variation of cross-sectionally, but with time to see how much these portfolios actually move together. I think at the beginning of your presentation, you said you excluded a bunch of firms like utilities, financial firms that weren't uh, that uh, that weren't affected by the change in directors. But I encourage you to include them as a, as a control, uh, especially if they were affected by the rest of the governance reforms, but not by the uh, by the change in director term limits. Then you you sort of have uh, they're they're a control. Uh, for all the other governance reforms, uh, and then you can tease out the uh, just narrowly the effects of the change in director term limits. Yeah. Um, just as a, a two quick points. One point is a bunch of us in this room have looked at this idea of independent directors and in controlling situations in Asia. Um, so there is there is a legal literature on this. Um, but the, the second point that's interesting, which I wonder you, if you looked at, was um, did you look at all the, the size of the board increase? And the reason why I'm saying this is in Singapore, uh, there has been a nine-year limit that was put in. It was put in first as soft law under the corporate governance code, and then it was put in um, as a, a two-tier vote. Um, finally, they've now made it very hard law. And the discussion is that what may happen, and it's just been put in, is that board size will increase. Uh, why will board size increase? Because if you really want to keep someone on the board, you just declassify them as no longer outside. And you add another director to the board, and you can keep that person still on the board. Right? So I, I'm, I'm curious whether you measured uh, board size. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I wanted to point out uh, two points. And uh, first, I mean, as John mentioned, I, mean, uh, I, I actually I wrote about the you know, Chinese independent director system in 2016. I mentioned you know, the independent directors sometimes raise objections during informal sessions over over private conversation uh, before the, the former uh, board meeting. And so uh, that's a known number. However, that's a critical. Uh, so I want to, I, I just call it independent directors and direct and the determines effect. Uh, then the second point is that I mean, utility and the, the financial companies, I think uh, you should exclude uh, because uh, because uh, uh, they are they are they are uh, the you know the uh, I mean uh, not controlling share, controlling shareholders and companies because uh, we uh, the, we want to know the controlling shareholders independent uh, directors. So in Korea, utilities and the financial companies are, uh, they, they don't have the controlling shareholders. So I think it's, uh, it, it makes sense I mean, to exclude those uh, kind of operations. Yeah, so I think that's it. Uh, thank you very much. One might is the fact that boards are deliberative bodies in which individuals can be thought of as interacting with one another, not as you know automatons who are pre-programmed to vote in a particular way. They're bringing different perspectives and information and kind of a deliberative persuasion game with one another. <clears throat> and there, these new outside directors may have a big effect, not only by bringing different votes, but by swaying votes who are uh, who are internal. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you can, how you might be able to get at that. There's a reasonable literature in like positive political theory on this. It hasn't been kind of brought over to, to governance very much. But the, the data set that has individual vote decisions might be pretty rich if, if you could sort of take another cue from some of the political science literature and maybe, uh, and maybe try to extract um, ideology scores uh, amongst the directors, uh, and then ask if a new when, when new directors go on, does that does that visit a shock and you know kind of the analog of a, a Martin Quinn type of type of score on these directors? I don't know how rich the data set is, but you know I've never encountered this kind of data set at the director level, and it'd be a pretty cool thing to do. Just just very briefly about the, the data. Yeah. 
I think what thing you can do is to look at the quality of the items that are being quoted. That's because I think somebody brought up numbers, you gotta look at the quality to the extent you can actually read the decisions that are being quoted. Right? So because these are these are actual quoting and then you can see what is what is what are the items that they are they're quoting on. And this also has an impact on the reputation in the labor market for these directors because it is a term limit, but that doesn't mean that that's the end of your board directorship career, right? You can still continue to be board directors in other firms, in other business groups. So this has an implication on the labor market outcomes as well for these uh, directors. I had a question which follows along from the kind of behavioral side of this and the decision making processes uh, and the sense that somehow if you're driven to actually dissent and something's gone wrong in the way that the board interacts. And I just wondered whether you're seeing any pattern in dissent and abstention decisions for what people dissent on. Are there particular issues that um, are coming up again and again in this context which would suggest that there is some perhaps more underlying systemic issue uh, going on as well? Oh, sorry. Uh, okay, Meredith, go ahead. Okay. Um, these are, I think, just maybe variations on John's comments. But uh, one, it seems to me a lot depends on uh, how much stock you put in your first results, which are the event study results, because otherwise, and reflecting on some of the other comments here, who's to say whether it's an improvement that you get more dissenting votes rather than fewer. And I, the other is, I think in your literature discussion, I really do think you have to be modest about uh, the implications of this for other countries because, you know, to the extent you're looking at a horse race between um, long-term directors being overly subservient to control shareholders or management or whatever, versus experience or whatever else comes from good from long uh, long service, um, those ratios are, you know, would very likely be very different in, in other countries. Yeah, so this is related uh, about the dissent. Um, maybe you could look at a different kind of outcome. There must have been a reason why this reform was put in place. Uh, was this to curb related public transactions? Uh, was there another outcome variable that people had in mind? So rather than looking at stock prices, maybe you could look at the target of the reform in terms of actual behaviors of um, you know, corporate action. So, you have like nine minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you for all the questions and the interest that you have shown on Let's see. First questions was uh, the magnitude was too large. Um, let me go to my slide. Um, so here is, yeah, for example, here's the larger one. So if you look at the first column, it's, it's really small. It's only one percent. Um, so only one percent increase in the share price. The the the. Just the jump in the drop is uh, significant and large only when you interact with key, uh, key, uh, the current corporate governance score. So what I'm doing is, so this, if I interpret this correctly, you're actually comparing with the firms at, at the really bottom of corporate governance uh, quality and the ones that are really on the top. So that kind of, uh, that's the reason why the magnitude looks large, but uh, the overall magnitude is not very large. I hope that will help you to believe my story. <laughs> um, and then, um, yes, uh, the, the comment about uh, why don't you, instead of comparing LTODs who step down and uh, newly elected also the why don't you compare with LTODs that, that stayed around for some reason uh, and compare that with the newly outside directors, newly elected outside directors, because you can now you know compare uh, those voting decisions in the same year. So I think that's a... Uh, Cool idea. Um, board size, I didn't uh, investigate, um, but I think that's an interesting idea. Whether uh, you know 
these control shareholders and managers, they love this LTV so much, they just want to keep him, but not as an outside director, but as a, like a non-risen inside director. I think that's an interesting um, thing to uh, do. Um, ideology uh, score of individual directors, I think that was your comment. That's also very interesting. Uh, I don't know how I can do this. Uh, so I do have some you know, characteristics data for individual directors. Um, yeah, so I think uh, that's an interesting idea to explore. Maybe not in this paper, but in some other uh, papers. Um, reputation and the outcome in the labor market. Uh, I, I did look at this because uh, the other 2016 paper uh, actually focused on that. But I didn't find any systematic result. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't really, th th their dissent in the second term didn't help them to get an outside director position uh, more likely or uh, less. It didn't really have any impact. Their dissent did not really have an impact on the uh, labor market after they stepped down. Um, being uh, modest to uh, the applicability to other countries, I, I fully agree. Um, I mean, each country is have a very different uh, corporate governance setting, and uh, being effective in Korea does not necessarily mean that it would be the case in other countries. Um, other outcomes, so, you know, in addition to share price, I did look at voting, but voting may not be the only outcome. I could look at what many other corporate governance studies do, like, uh, you know, like CO turnover sensitivity or you know, compensation. So those are the outcomes that we could look at, uh, but we were not able to do so uh, yet. Um, and then um, there was a, also a question about, uh, you know, the reform measures taking place gradually again and again during that time period. So even if I have like three different things, uh, you know, the kind of that may not be sufficient, it may be still confounded. Uh, but uh, so I, but the defense is that I do have three events. The first one is definitely compounded, which is why I have the second and third. And uh, this is an event study, so I'm looking at a very short period of time. And uh, it's, um, I didn't check, but uh, I don't think it's compounded with other reform measures, but I should check, yes. Um, so I, I, I don't think I answered all the questions, but I'll be happy to discuss this uh, during the break. Thank you.